everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for attending this webinar with Fullscript and Metagenics. My name is Amy Regan and I'm a Partner Marketing Specialist here at Fullscript. We are very excited to have this presentation by Dr. Heather Zwicky and a live Q&A session with Dr. Melissa Carullo today to discuss the connection between stress and immunity. Before we get into the presentation, I wanted to give a reminder that this record that a recording of the presentation and slide deck will be sent to everyone who registered at a later time. So if you have to leave early or just want to watch it again, you have direct access in your inbox. The recording and several Metagenics resource handouts will also be live on Fullscript's website at www.fullscript.com slash webinars, where you can access all of our past and upcoming webinars as well. Please place any questions you have throughout the webinar in the questions box, and we'll get them answered at the end. Dr. Heather Zwicky, PhD, earned a PhD in immu immunology and microbiology for the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center with a focus on infectious disease. Dr. Zwicky went on to complete a postdoctoral fellowship and teach medical school at Yale University. At the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon, Dr. Zwicky launched the Health Got Research Institute and established the School of Graduate Studies, developing programs in research, nutrition, and global health. Among others, she currently leads an NIH-funded clinical research training program. She, teach it, she teaches at many universities and speaks at conferences worldwide. At HealthGot Research Institute, Dr. Zwicky applies her immunology expertise to natural medicine with a specific interest in the gut-brain access in neuroinflammation. Before we begin, please note this webinar is designed for practitioners and healthcare professionals in mind. With that, here is the presentation from Dr. Zwicky. Hello, I'm Dr. Heather Zwicky, and today we're going to be talking about On the Clock, the connection between stress and immunity. A little more background on me. I have a PhD in immunology and microbiology from the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center in Denver. I completed a postdoc and taught medical school at Yale University School of Medicine and then moved on to Portland, Oregon, where I became the director of HealthGot Research Institute and a professor of immunology. I'm currently the director of communication and innovation at Thena, a microbiome-based company. As we get started, let me start with my disclosures. I do have some conflicts, but none should interfere with what we're going to talk about today. Here's our topics for discussion. We're going to start with stress and the HPA axis. Then we're going to move beyond that, and we're going to talk about communication between the gut and the central nervous system. We'll discuss cortisol and whether it's related to stress or circadian. And finally, we'll discuss therapeutic recommendations based on the microbiome. So let's go get ahead and get started with stress and the HPA axis. Stress, as it turns out, is very hard to define. There are absolute stressors. Pretty much everyone agrees that if your house burns down, it's a stressor. And really, those absolute stressors are related to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So as we think about things that we need, food, shelter, those are things that are going to be absolute stressors. Relative stressors are things that some people would interpret as stress and other people might not interpret as stress. So being stuck in traffic, for example, could be very stressful if you have someplace you have to be. But if you don't have anywhere you need to be and you've got a good podcast or you're jamming out to your favorite tunes, being stuck in traffic isn't so bad. At the Center for Stress Studies in Canada, they've defined recipes for stress. And we know that these essential ingredients cause a stressor. A lot of times the idea of jumping out of an airplane is a good example for how we might think of these as stressors. So for example, if it's new for you to jump out of an airplane, you've never done it before, you've never been skydiving, it's novel, it can be stressful. It's also unpredictable. If you've never done it before, you don't know what to expect, and that contributes to the stress of the event. 
There's threat to ego. Are you in control? Is someone else in control? Are you going to be embarrassed if you do something incorrectly? Those sorts of things are what cause stress. We've all just been through a lot of stress with the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that 42% of adults gained weight during the pandemic and some gained as much as 50 pounds. That's a stressful event. We know that 67% of Americans are sleeping either more or less since the pandemic started. 35% are getting less sleep, meaning eight hours a night is their ideal. They're getting less than six hours a night. 31% are getting more sleep. They want to sleep all the time. And many of them are reporting that they're getting between 10 and 12 hours of sleep a night. 23% report drinking more alcohol to cope with stress. Perhaps the pandemic has hit Gen Z the worst. These are the generation that were getting out of college and were expecting to go to work, but there were no jobs to be had. 46% of Gen Z, that'd be age 21 to 24 years old, say their lives have worsened since the pandemic. Let's review the HPA axis. And it starts with that feeling of stress. Now remember, that feeling of stress could be different between you and me. For example, if you get in a car accident, you might feel threat and that would cause a stress response. For me, I've actually been in 28 car accidents. A car accident is not a stressful event anymore, at least not an average car accident, because I'm not overwhelmed by it and I know I can cope with it. When we have that feeling of stress, that perception of threat, the first thing that happens is that we activate our hypothalamus to produce CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone. That triggers our pituitary to produce ACTH, which induces our adrenal glands to make cortisol. And cortisol is going to be produced until a feedback loop is triggered. That feedback loop goes back to the brain in roughly eight to 10 minutes to signal it to stop producing CRH. Now, cortisol's effects on the brain are actually not just restricted to the production of hormones. Cortisol has actually been shown to have a direct effect on brain size. We see brain atrophy, brain shrinkage with too much cortisol in a chronic stress situation. We also know that stress is not just having an effect on the brain. We, we see that stress has an effect on every system in the body. And in fact, because it is a whole body response, stress has now been termed as allostatic load, meaning that we add together all of the different systems that are affected by stress, including the metabolic system, the cardiovascular system, the immune system. All of these different outcomes are added together to create allostatic load, which is the load of stress on our body. We also have to remember that stress is cumulative. So you may not be experiencing any stress right now, but all the stress you felt as a child, all the stress that you felt over the last couple of years, socioeconomic stress, your employment status, all of those things combine and are additive. So we're, we see that allostatic load is a combination of what you're feeling today with everything you felt in the past. There are gender differences in the stress response, uh, specifically sex differences. And this has been measured with sex at birth. We see that females have a more robust response to acute stress. They make more CRH and ACTH. They also have a blunted feedback loop. That's because there's less glucocorticoid receptors in the brain in females. What that means is that they have a delayed return to normal response. When cortisol goes to the brain and attempts to shut down CRH, that response takes a little bit longer, which means women are going to experience stress for a longer period of time. Now, I don't want you to think that all stress is bad because it's not. We need stress. 
And in fact, mild stress can be beneficial. It can make us more alert. We've all experienced that situation where we have a deadline and time stress is very much a um, stimulator of our mild stress. We have a deadline and we work better to a deadline. Short-term stress actually causes neuroproliferation and better brain performance, as long as it's what we would consider mild. In fact, maternal stress, I'm talking about stress in a pregnant woman, can actually advance early childhood development. This was a study that was done in 2006. And uh, pregnant women had been very concerned about whether or not stress was damaging the fetus. So a study was done at Harvard that showed that actually children of mildly stressed moms have better developmental scores at age two years than children of moms who didn't consider themselves stressed. In that study and in studies that have followed up on that data, it matters what mom's personality is and whether mom also experiences postpartum stress. As you can imagine, moms who are stressed during pregnancy are often also stressed after they have a baby. And it is the stress after the baby that actually has a detrimental effect on the infant. Stress may also help, help us build resilience. And in these studies, um, these have been done in animals, we see that hardship and adversity in early life leads to epigenetic changes that we need for resilience. So they're actually having an effect on genetic regulation. What matters in these studies is the degree of control over the stressor that the person has. If you don't have control at all over your stressor, that may lead to vulnerability instead of resilience. But if you have some control over your stressor and you're able to reframe the stressor, it can actually lead to developing resilience. So, so far, here's where we're at. We know that our history of stress and our perception of stress impacts our stress response. We also know that pandemic stress has impacted everyone, even if they haven't had COVID. Now let's talk about communication between the gut and the central nervous system. To do that, I want to use these three hypotheses. And these are hypotheses about the gut-brain axis because we're still figuring out all the details. I'll tell you which details we know and which ones are still theory. We're going to discuss guts produce, gut microbes producing neurotransmitters. We're going to talk about gut microbes stimulating our immune cells to produce cytokines. And we're going to talk about gut microbes producing metabolites and those having an effect on the stress response. So first, this. Gut microbes can produce neurotransmitters. This might be new information to you. So let's first go back and talk about which neurotransmitters we're actually talking about. And then how does that happen? So dopamine, serotonin, GABA, and acetylcholine can all be produced by microbes in the gut. Now, as a reminder, dopamine is our reward neurotransmitter. This is that neurotransmitter that when we get an unexpected surprise, like someone we care about sends us flowers and we feel, woo, that's a dopamine reward. Dopamine also has an effect on whether or not we're extroverted or introverted and whether or not we have a positive affect or a negative affect. In other words, are we glass half full or glass half empty? Serotonin is our happiness neurotransmitter. This is our neurotransmitter that's involved in motivation, helps get us off the couch. It's also involved in a sense of calm. GABA is our inhibitory neurotransmitter. We call it an inhibitory transmitter because it tends to shut down the excitation that we feel with glutamate. GABA makes us relaxed and focused. It also helps us sleep through the night. We make the most GABA in the middle of the night. So if we're not sleeping well, we may be having trouble with produce, producing GABA. Acetylcholine is our calm 
neurotransmitter. Now, most of us think of acetylcholine as stimulatory because when we get a huge burst of acetylcholine, then we are excitable. But at normal healthy levels, acetylcholine actually regulates our anxiety. A few years ago, we started figuring out that it wasn't just our neurons that were producing neurotransmitters. It turns out that microbes in our gut microbiota also produce neurotransmitters. GABA is produced by lactobacillus and by phytobacterium. And I want to circle back to this for just a second because lactobacillus and by phytobacterium are two of the strains of microbes that we commonly find in probiotics. So is it possible that people feel better when they take a probiotic because those probiotics are producing GABA? Noradrenaline is produced by E. coli, bacillus, and saccharomyces, which is a yeast. Serotonin is produced by candida, streptococcus, E. coli, and enterococcus. Dopamine by bacillus, and acetylcholine by lactobacillus. Now, I often get that question of who cares? They're being produced in the gut means they're not having an effect on the brain, right? Not so. As it turns out, we know that the neurotransmitters that are produced in the gut can have an effect on the brain because there are transporters for these neurotransmitters in the blood-brain barrier. So it is possible for these neurotransmitters to have an effect on the central nervous system. What I've got for you here is a model that shows that gut-brain axis. So we see that gut microbiota can either alter neurotransmitters in the brain, or they can be produced in the gut and tra travel to the brain, or they can have an effect on cytokine secretion and stress hormone regulation, or we can get signaling through the vagus nerve. So there's multiple different ways that the neurotransmitters produced in the gut actually have an effect on the brain. We're going to move on and talk about the next hypothesis, that gut microbes can stimulate immune cells to produce cytokines. First, we have to remember that stress and inflammation are related. So the Nobel Prize was won in 1956 for showing that stress can actually shut down an immune response. But does all immunity cease during stress? The answer is no. If you think about how we evolved the stress response, we evolved running from the lion. And that's how we like to think about stress. We're running from that lion. What would happen if the lion caught you? Well, if the lion caught you, you would likely have an injury to your skin. And therefore, that's where your immune system goes during a stress response. If we think about our evolution of stress, we were prepared for being injured. So whether that injury was from a lion or from, from battle, our immune response goes to our skin. And many of us have experienced that where we get stressed and we immediately get flush or during a stress response, we break out. We know that during stress, inflammation continues. And in fact, we actually see that inflammation can even precede a stressful event. Immunological memory is actually blunted during a stress response. So this is our specific immunity. T cells and B cells, things that we have made to a vaccine or an infectious disease, they're suppressed during a stressful event. I think our body is thinking, why am I worried about the flu when I'm running from this tiger? I'm running from this lion. So we suppress specific immunity, but we still have an inflammatory response. Now, the degree of pathology we have with inflammation is dependent on three cytokines, IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. And that's whether our inflammation is acute or chronic. Usually when we're thinking about acute inflammation, we're thinking about an infection starting an acute inflammatory response. When we think about chronic inflammation, we have to think about other stimuli. And indeed, stress is one of the major stimuli of chronic inflammation. Other sources of chronic inflammation are hypersensitivities. That could be true whether it's to a food 
or to a metal or to insect bites. Dysbiosis is another form of chronic inflammation. If our gut microbes are not in balance, we do not produce the cytokines that shut down chronic inflammation. Obesity actually leads to chronic inflammation because it turns out that macrophages that are in fat tissue chronically produced IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. And finally, gum disease is a source of chronic inflammation and probably one of the biggest sources of chronic inflammation for cardiovascular disease. These cytokines cause inflammation, um, all the tenets of inflammation. They go to the hypothalamus and they produce fever and they produce uh, temperature changes and pain, swelling, etc. But they also have behavioral symptoms associated with them. IL-1 is the cytokine that makes us feel sleepy and tired. So when we are starting to get sick and we just want to go to bed and we feel malaise, like we can't move, that's IL-1. Now, what's interesting about these cytokines is not only do these cytokines trigger the behavior of malaise and fatigue and depression, it's a bi-directional relationship. So if you are feeling depressed, if you're feeling fatigued, you will produce IL-1, bi-directional. IL-6 is our anxiety cytokine. This is the cytokine that we feel when we start to get anxious, like, I can't be sick right now. I have too much to do. That's IL-6 talking. IL-6 also makes us feel fatigue, also can be involved in a pain response. And again, that bi-directional relationship. So if we're stuck in traffic and we're feeling anxious, we will produce IL-6. Finally, there's TNF-alpha, and TNF-alpha is our aggression, our hostility cytokine. If we are feeling aggressive, we produce TNF-alpha and vice versa. Interestingly, TNF-alpha is also involved in the sleep response. So if we're producing high levels of TNF-alpha, it's hard for us to sleep through the night. Now, why do these cytokines have an effect on our mood states, on our on our personalities? Well, it turns out it has to do with the kynurenine pathway. Typically, if we eat protein that contains tryptophan, we'll trigger the production of serotonin and tryptamine der derivatives. And then serotonin is further processed into melatonin. However, if we're experiencing inflammation, Inflammatory cytokines increase the production of IDO, the enzyme that shuttles tryptophan through the kynurenine pathway. And it ultimately leads to the production of quinolones. And it is these quinolones that are actually having an effect on brain atrophy. So the whole pathway goes together here. Our inflammatory cytokines are making it so we can't be happy, we're not producing serotonin, we can't sleep because we're not producing melatonin, and instead we're causing damage to our brain. Let's move on and talk about that third hypothesis, and that is that gut microbes are producing metabolites that are having an effect on our stress response. First, I just wanna remind you how this pathway goes. When we ingest fiber, it's called prebiotics. And prebiotics have gotten a much larger definition over the last two years. It used to be that prebiotics, we were really talking about inulins and things like psyllium. We now know that all sorts of different flavonoids and polyphenols can be considered prebiotics. So spices, beta-glucans that we find in yeast and mushrooms, all of these things impact the gut microbiota development and are now considered prebiotics. Probiotics are the live bacteria which eat the prebiotics. And then postbiotics are the metabolites which are produced by fermentation um, from those live bacteria. So postbiotics might be a new term for you. And I just want to remind you what some of these metabolites that are that are being produced by the bacteria. You'll see on the top row here, acetate, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. 
These are the short chain fatty acids. And of course, short chain fatty acids are one of the metabolites produced by gut bacteria. But there's so much more than just short chain fatty acids. We know that there are branch chain fatty acids, there are the kynurenines, the indols, indol derivatives, and then what do we see? This, those neurotransmitters, right? Serotonin and histamine and dopamine. There are beneficial metabolites, and then there are some metabolites that are not so beneficial. So we might think of TMAO or P-Cresol. But these metabolites are all considered postbiotics at this point, and the vast majority of them are beneficial. Let's talk about cortisol and whether it is stressful or circadian. I had to include this picture because I feel like this is the picture that kind of summarizes how we have all spent the last couple of years. Many of us have been in social isolation. And even those of us who were in the medical field, who were working our tails off, would get home and collapse. And that co collapse is a result of using up our cortisol. So here's what happened. We experienced isolation, and that isolation has contributed to the dysbiotic state of our guts, and that has led to stress. Let's break it down. Isolation means that we had less exposure to others' microbes. That's because we were often wearing masks, and believe it or not, just like Pigpen in Charlie Brown, we carry a collection of microbes around us all the time. And when we're talking to people, we spit at them and they pick up our microbes. That exposure is part of how we build our microbiome and how we keep a state of health. By wearing masks and using a lot of hand sanitizer, we have been exposed to a lot less microbes than we were in the past, which means our cytokines are different than they were historically. We also got a lot less exercise, and many of us over ate. That changes the gut metabolites that we were uh, used to seeing. And interestingly, the exercise is what pushes those metabolites into the bloodstream. So if we stop moving, we don't get the same dose of short chain fatty acids in the rest of our body. We also see that the media has been providing us a lot of stress and those stressors may cause a reduction in our dopamine, give us a negative affect. And so if we look at what has come out of balance, our metabolites aren't in balance, our neurotransmitters, our cytokines, our hormones, especially our glucocorticoids may be out of balance and all of those things contribute to stress and stress contributes to all of those things. So if we go back and we think about our model of the HPA axis, we have to recognize that that cortisol that is at the bottom of the HPA axis is the very same cortisol that is involved in our circadian rhythms. It's the very same cortisol that impacts our cytokines. So how does that relationship work if we're stressed? It turns out, usually, our cortisol is affected by our suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is in the brain. That's our master clock. And that master clock affects all of the peripheral clocks, which are in all of the cells of our body, regulating not only the HPA axis, but our diurnal pattern of cortisol. That pattern that pushes cortisol to its maximum in the morning and drops it off the rest of the day so that we can go to sleep at the end of the night. Now, if we have a stressor, if the bomb goes off, what happens is instead of the HPA axis and the autonomic nervous system cross-regulating each other, the HPA axis kind of takes over and it starts regulating that autonomic nervous system and we increase our glucocorticoids regardless of the circadian rhythm. We increase our norepinephrine regardless of the circadian rhythm. So stress changes our diurnal regulation of cortisol. It's having a systemic effect, as we mentioned before, allostatic load. That systemic effect is due to the neurotransmitter dysregulation. That's how we feel stress. It has an effect on our mental and emotional components, our relationships. We start to feel burnout. 
As we discussed, it also has an effect on inflammation. Our cytokines become dysregulated. And that's going to impact whether or not we are susceptible to infectious disease. What are allergy responses? It's going to give us GI issues because we're going to make more um, neurotransmitters and more cytokines that disrupt the microbes in our gut. Our metabolism is going to be affected because we get glycemic dysregulation. If we're stressed, and especially in acute stress situations, we release more sugar into our bloodstream so that we can run from that lion. But in this situation where we've just had a pandemic where people had low physical activity, we release that glycemic load and there was no activity to use it up. And we put on weight. In addition, Stress often causes stress eating. That's the desire for additional dopamine. So we get the same dopamine reward when we eat sugar as we do when we have an actual reward. So if we aren't getting our normal interactions with other people, we're not getting smiles from a stranger that stimulates a dopamine reward, we'll eat to get that dopamine reward. And our sleep is dysregulated. Well, sleep apnea is not necessarily caused by stress. We know that sleep apnea is exacerbated by stress because the inflammation causes a swelling in the um, nasal pharynx, and that may actually increase sleep apnea. We also see that when people don't sleep through the night, there's no reset of their NLRP3 inflammasome, and so they have more inflammation happening. Now, the microbiome is also related here in that our superchiasmatic nucleus, the top of the screen here, is regulating our light dark, dark cycles. As it turns out, our microbiome responds to that diurnal pattern. Our microbiome expects you to go to sleep at night. And when you go to sleep at night, it changes how much nutrients are being processed. If you're one of those people who eats in the middle of the night, you're having a direct effect on your microbiome. It's waking up so that it can process that food. And in doing so, it sends a message to the suprachiasmatic nucleus saying this person should be awake. So while you might think you're getting that midnight snack so you can sleep, your brain is thinking you're eating now. It's time to wake up. So that microbiome stress relationship turns out is very important. So here's where we are so far. Social isolation has disrupted our neurotransmitters, our hormones, our cytokines, and our microbial metabolites leading to stress. And our stress hormone cortisol interacts not only with the HPA axis and the circadian rhythm, but also with immune function and our microbiome. If that's the case, could it be that a therapeutic approach is to impact the microbiome? We have all these different things that we could address to address stress. We could go at hormones. We can try to reduce our glucocorticoids. We might do that with meditation. We can go with the cytokines. We could try to reduce the inflammatory cytokines. And maybe we do that with hormones, um, like administering a glucocorticoid, or maybe we do that with herbs. We could try to approach the neurotransmitters. But the interesting thing is that all of these things are actually affected by the gut microbiome. And the gut microbiome is probably the easiest thing to have an effect on. Because we know that prebiotics, probiotics, and postbiotics all have an effect on all of these different pathways. So let's just remind ourselves what the therapeutic microbes are. Prebiotics are the food that feed the, microbi mi the microbiome. Probiotics are the live bacteria. Postbiotics are metabolites that are made by bacteria. Parabiotics, that might be a new one for you, that's 
heat killed probiotics and parabiotics are starting to hit the market now too. Really the food industry has been looking for parabiotics for a long time because they've wanted to put probiotics into foods like orange juice and an acidic orange juice will kill a live probiotic. So parabiotics allows the food industry to use therapeutic microbes. And then there are synbiotics. Synbiotics are a combination of a probiotic with a prebiotic. Fermented foods are a great example of a synbiotic. So what can you do today to address microbes therapeutically? Well, the big thing is you could increase dietary fiber because we know that increased dietary fiber correlates with increased microbial diversity. Now, what is that microbial diversity? There have been a number of studies over the past five years that have shown that alpha diversity, which means the diversity of microbes that are in you in a single person, is correlated with health. The more alpha diversity you have, the less likely you are to be obese, the less likely you are to have high blood pressure, the less likely you are to have uh, poor lipids. So we correlate alpha diversity with health. And if we increase dietary fiber, we see an increase in microbial diversity. So increased dietary fiber equals health. Why? Well, increased microbial diversity from that increased dietary fiber correlates with an increased production of short chain fatty acids. There's our postbiotics. And then increased production of the short chain fatty acid butyrate in particular correlates with immune health and the production of a particular cytokine called TGF beta. TGF beta turns out to be very important because it reduces inflammation. It can balance neurotransmitters and help balance glucocorticoids, probably along with several other microbial metabolites. It's just that butyrate is the one that is best studied. Now I want to point out that this is butyrate that is produced by eating fiber. And I'm pointing that out because you can buy butyrate as a supplement, but we know that butyrate as a supplement doesn't have the same effect. This is because butyrate is in ratio with acetate and propionate. So acetate is three to one propionate and one butyrate. And if you just take butyrate, you throw off the ratio. You actually have to have all three of the short chain fatty acids in combination to get the best effect. You need the acetate in order to get the acidity in the gut to make all of the enzymes work. So if you just have the butyrate and you didn't actually increase acetate and propionate, then you may not get the same effect. One of the groups that's studying all of this is the American Gut Project. This is a group run by Rob Knight's group in San Diego, and they did a really interesting study. In this study, they were curious about whether a particular type of diet was best for alpha diversity for the microbiome. Now, this is panel B from a figure of a paper they wrote. Um, and panel B is specifically talking about these different types of diets. So in the upper right hand corner, you can see omnivore versus vegetarian versus omnivore with no red meat vegetarian who eats seafood and vegan. And their expectation was that people who were vegetarian or vegan might have the most alpha diversity. So they expected to see off in that uh, right hand corner that you would have blue and purple dots and none of the red and orange dots. It turns out that the blue and purple are all over the place and the red and the green, they're all over the place. And what separates these two groups is actually the number of plant-based foods that folks were eating per week. The group on the right is eating 30 plant-based foods or more per week. Let me repeat that. 30 plant-based foods or more per week. This is not 30 servings. This is 30 different plant-based foods per week. It turns out that the diversity of the plants that we are eating has a profound effect on our alpha diversity, which means I'm going to ask you 
and your patients to get their 30. So really what we're looking at is diversity. And you'll notice that some of the things that I have here, this is my 30 plant-based foods. Some of these things are spices. Some are nuts. We have um, fruits and vegetables and beans. What matters at the, is that there are 30 plant-based foods. So instead of eating an, an enormous spinach salad, eat a spinach salad that also has tomato and pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds and, and throw in some craisins and some avocado. It matters more that you get the diversity than that you get the huge serving size. So to wrap up, I just want to remind us how we're going to rejuvenate our microbiome. We know that gardening and being out in nature has an effect on your microbiome. Certainly with gardening, as you can imagine, there are microbes in the soil and those microbes in the soil get on you and they hang out with your skin microbes. We also know that pets have a, an effect of increasing your alpha diversity. Likely this is because pets self groom, they clean themselves with their tongue and that introduces their microbiome to their fur. And then when we pet them, we pick up those microbes. All of these things are very healthy for our microbiome. We need to be exposed to more microbes to increase our alpha diversity. We also need to do less things that kill off our microbes. So less hand sanitizer, fewer antibiotics, fewer non-antibiotic medications, because it turns out these kill off our microbes as well. So do pesticides and preservatives. In fact, if you think about it, the whole reason for having a preservative in a food is to kill off microbes. The problem is it doesn't just kill off microbes in our food, it also kills off microbes in our gut. We can take prebiotics, food, probiotics, symbiotics, and fermented foods, and now, with the new introduction of postbiotics, we can take postbiotics to have an effect on our microbiome as well. We also need to be thinking about rejuvenating our lifestyle. We need to get our 30 plant-based foods per week. We need to reduce our stress, turn off that media, meditate, find good coping behaviors. We need to move to get those micro microbiome metabolites into our bloodstream. So get up from our computers, get outside, find excuses to move. And we need to sleep. We know that if we aren't sleeping, our cortisol is going to be dysregulated and GABA is decreasing inflammation. So do what we can to get good sleep hygiene and sleep through the night. I hope you've learned something and I hope you can figure out at least one of these things that you can do to improve your microbiome. Our immune systems have suffered in the past two years. We now have chronic inflammation, which is contributing to depression, anxiety, stress, fatigue. We know that this bi-directional relationship that we have with cortisol and neurotransmitters, cytokines and metabolism and sleep is impacting our entire body. To address immune rejuvenation, we have to address that microbiome. So our central focus should be increasing microbial diversity. And maybe the easiest way to do that is to eat 30 different plant-based foods per week. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us for that presentation. Now joining us to have a deeper dive into targeted support for regulating the HPA access. And for our Q&A session is Dr. Melisa Carrillo, ND, Clinical Affairs Liaison for Metagenics. Welcome, Dr. Carrillo. Okay, so thanks, Amy. And thanks to uh, Dr. Zwicky. Um, she, that was just an incredible presentation. She makes really hard concepts seem really easy. So I appreciate her knowledge and just love all the physiological connections she made. Um, between the organ systems, so that was great. Um, so for the next five minutes or so, I'm just gonna go through a few products that would be beneficial in regulating um, the HPA access. So I think we can all agree that there are a few supplements that individuals should be taking ongoing as foundation nutrition support. Um, and what you're seeing here is wellness essentials. 
Uh, Wellness Essentials, they deliver a few of these supplements in a daily packet for patients. Um, they come in a box, there's 30 pack packets per box, um, so a month's supply. Um, and you're seeing both men's vitality and women's wellness essentials here. So both men's and women's wellness essentials, they contain uh, Phytomulti and Omegagenics EPA DHA. Um, the men's packet will also contain a zinc tablet for uh, immune and reproductive health and then one tablet each of two formulas. Um, and those formulas will support healthy sexual function and hormone balance. Uh, the women's wellness essentials, um, in addition to the uh, multivitamin and uh, fish oil, will contain two bone builder tablets. Um, and the main ingredient in those tablets are uh, microcrystalline hydroxy appetite concentrates. So um, a really efficient way of increasing um, um, bone density. I just wanted to uh, briefly review what makes this uh, multivitamin, the Phytomulti, unique uh, when we compare it against other multivitamins, uh, multivitamin, multimineral supplements on the market. So the Phytomulti is essentially two supplements in one. It's a multivitamin and mineral supplement, but also contains 13 whole plant extracts. Uh, chromatography testing is completed to confirm the phytochemical activity of the unique blend of phytonutrients. Um, and some of the phytonutrients found uh, to have the highest activity and that are included in this formula are um, artichoke, uh, pomegranate prunus, watercress, um, blueberry, um, and that's just, just to name a few. So some of the testing completed, completed on the formula was um, both a comet assay and a functional auric assay. And they were both done uh, to help really design the ingredient mix that was used in the formula. So the total auric assay actually measures antioxidant capacity, and it measures this against five uh, primary reactive oxygen species found in humans. And this is opposed to the traditional auric assay, uh, and that only captures the antioxidant capacity against uh, peroxyl radicals. So Phytomulti's um, chemical, phytom chemical blend, um, which, is, which you find in one tablet, it actually scores uh, within the range of 11,000 to 12,000 on an auric scale. Um, so it's, it's quite high on the auric scale. It's, it's very impressive range. Uh, the comet assay, this measures at the individual cell level. So in this case, we would be measuring against uh, human T lymphocytes um, with this study in the Phytomulti. Um, and what is being measured here is the maintenance of DNA integrity. And it would be the integrity of the cells following um, their exposure to some kind of oxidative damage. So you can see um, in the diagram on the left, the first row is the control cells. Then we have uh, those that were not pretreated with the phytonutrients. And then finally, cells that were um, pretreated in the third row with, with the phytonutrient blend. And you can see from the third row that the phytomulti effectively reduces that oxidative damage that peroxides could cause um, to cells. So it reduces cell damage. Um, so, you know, there's uh, some additional studies done on this. Um, on this final multi actually in uh, human clinical trials. So if you're interested, um, you can reach out to your rep, your local rep to get that information. But again, just a multivitamin showing that um, how it can really improve one's resilience when they're induced with uh, multiple stressors. Uh, the next formula is the Ultra GI Replenish. Uh, this is a medical food formulated to provide uh, specialized macro and micronutrient support. Um, this would be for patients challenged by uh, compromised gut function, digestive disorders, including malabsorption. Um, and so it's a really impressive formula. Uh, it was, um, in addition to the macro micronutrient profile, um, there's some ingredients in here that are just groundbreaking. So they're super unique. Uh, one of them is the glutamine dipeptide. This is LL alanyl L-glutamine. So it's designed for enhanced absorption, stability, and solubility. Um, so we're actually getting twice the amount of glutamine um, over the brush border than we would with um, just glutamine alone. 
Um, this formula contains uh, prebiotics, so it contains isomaltose oligosaccharides, and then also nature identical human milk oligosaccharides. So we heard Dr. Zwicky talk um, quite a bit about um, pre and postbiotics. And so what we have um, with the IMOs is they're going to encourage the production of the short chain fatty acids, um, and that would help with the mucosal, um, mucosal and intestinal issues. And then nature identical HMOs. So this would be um, two fucosalacto, fucosalactos. Um, and this is to help nourish beneficial bacteria in the gut. We really want to promote that microbial balance um, so that the, the bad bugs don't you know, overtake a lot of the um, habitat there. Ultraflora Biome Pro, uh, this is a multi strain probiotic. It contains uh, eight clinically studied strains and they support gastrointestinal health and immune health. There's 105 colony forming units per capsule and um, all the probiotics, as are all, all probiotics sold by Metagenics, the potency is guaranteed through the end of the labeled expiration date. Um, so you can guarantee that it's, it's going to have power through um, um, 14 months or approximately 14 months. Uh, the clinical trial results for this probiotic showed that just after 10 days of consuming just one capsule of the eight strain combo, there was an increase in Fecali bacterium presnitsky and Acromancia mucifila. So they were both present in the gut. And this is exciting finding because these are the bacteria that are considered potentially these keystone species. So they have potential roles in supporting diversity and organization of the gut ecosystem. So for those running GI panels, um, and we're not really sure what to do when we see these uh, two bacteria in low amounts, Ultraflora Biome Pro, sorry about that, Ultraflora Biome Pro is something you could um, give these patients to improve that profile. Um, the last formula is Ultraflora Spectrum. So this is another probiotic, and this provides multidimensional uh, daily support for both upper and lower GI tract. Um, it's going to support both digestive and immune health in both areas. Um, this is also a concentrated formula. Um, it's seven probiotic strains total, and one of those um, being Saccharomyces boulardii. So that is the end of the slide portion. I think that if there's any questions, um, I can try to answer them now for you. Otherwise, uh, we will post them to Dr. Zwicky. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And we did have some questions come in. So anybody who has any additional questions, uh, please pop them into the question box and we'll do sure. our best to answer them now. So um, uh, let's see here. So is the female robust stress response blunted? feedback mechanism related to estrogen or progesterone, progesterone levels? If so, does this change throughout the menstrual cycle or during perimenopause? Yeah, so obviously Dr. Zwicky would have a way more elaborate answer than I would. Um, and we could add to it when we talk to her, but um, definitely, right? Anything that is yeah. going to be a stressor um, or considered a stressor for the body will alter that stress response. So any hormone imbalance, changes in hormones, um, you know, increase in estrogen. Again, it's, it's the body can't really tell whether um, there's a good response to stress or a bad response to stress. It's more like the totality of the uh, stress responses. And is that glass overflowing with time? So Yes, the answer is yes, it will have an effect um, and in every one of those areas, depending how unbalanced the hormones might be. Excellent. Um, another question we have is how do postbiotics work? Yeah, so the postbiotics are going to be the metabolites of whatever the prebiotic or the uh, probiotic will um will make in the body or, or what what it's going to do to the body so it could be the uh, short chain fatty acids it could be um helping and short chain fatty acids would help the intestinal mucosa um production it could be vitamins such as vitamin uh, k that that might be um a, a byproduct of some of the metabolites so it really just depends on what pre and probiotic were giving given and then what they're capable of doing Excellent. 
Um, are there practitioner-based testing that measures alpha diversity available? Alpha diversity? Yes. What she, I'm not sure what they mean by that. Um, Excellent. We'll move on. They can but, just elaborate? Yes. Yeah, we can ask them to elaborate about the alpha mm -hmm. diversity, please. And I have a couple more questions coming in here. Do you have a probiotic without a prebiotic? Yeah, so the Ultraflorum Biome Pro and both Ultraflorum Spectrum were in the presentation. Those are both pre um, probiotics with no prebiotics in them. So one's an eight strain, one's a seven strain. Um, but in addition to those probiotics, uh, Metagenics does have a full um, a suite of probiotics available with no uh, probiotics, sorry, probiotics with no prebiotics present in them. Excellent. And um, from a practitioner, when would I give Ultra Floral Biome Pro over Ultra Flora Spectrum? Just the yeah, comparison so, there. Perfect. Yep. So um, Ultra Flora Spectrum has been around for quite some time. It, it contains a lot of strains that were um, ground groundbreaking decades ago. Um, it has Saccharomyces boulardii, which is still a you know a favorite for some practitioners. Ultraflorum Biome Pro is really a combination of strains um, that we've, we do have in other probiotics in the suite. Um, so when we're looking at Biome Pro, we're gonna basically look for things that might be um, dermatologically related, um, post um, antibiotic use, um, any acute inflammation. So anything we could do to like kind of like give the body a big bang right away um, and kind of restore the biome that's what we would be looking for with biome pro versus ultra floor spectrum is like kind of like a shotgun approach um, if we're trying to hit a lot of things at once we might give that mm -hmm. excellent all right and i believe that that is most of the questions that we have had come in. So I just want to say thank you so much to um, Dr. Carullo for joining us. Such a great presentation by Dr. Zwicky. And anybody who has any additional questions, they can send them right over to me. My email address is amy, amy regan that's Amy Regan, at fullscript.com. <laughs> And I just want to say thank you again to Metagenics. And just a quick reminder that you will receive a copy of this recording in your inbox along with the slide deck and the handouts sometime next week. You will also find all webinars on fullscript.com slash webinars. And thank you so much again. And everyone enjoy their afternoon. Thanks. Thank you.